today. It's unusual yeah. for us. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started then. I will call to order the meeting. Um, it is a meeting of the Hamilton County Board of County Commissioners, July 2nd, 2020. This is our regular meeting held on Thursdays. Um, we are doing things a little differently today uh, because we have a couple of public hearings. And so we are going to allow public input today beyond just written documents that have been sent to us. So I'm excited to try this out as a bit of an experiment. Um, so everybody bear with us. Uh, but we will do our best to um, get through this. I do think this is a step forward for sure. So um, just to, we're just gonna have to work out the kinks together. Um, so as always, we'll start the um, meeting with silent prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, this so we'll is a do step forward silent for prayer sure. first, and so, then I know Bridget um, just, uh, um, has to access to a flag. Together. And so uh, Bridget, I will uh, cue and then we'll have the flag up. So let's move into silent prayer. We'll start the um, Amen. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United, of the United States, States of America, America. and to the Republic, to the Republic for which, which, it which it stands, one nation. Under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move that we approve of the minutes of the previous session. Second. Mr. Dewhouse? Yes. Mr. Summer Dumas? Yes. Mr. Parks? Yes. Thank you. Um, so next on the agenda is public comment. So um, as I said, we've got a couple of public hearings um, just a little bit later in the agenda. And so if you are a person that is online to be part of those public hearings, we are going to ask you to hold for a moment because the public comment se session today is about anything that is not on the agenda. So if you're here about something on the agenda, even related to the public hearings or something else, hold for the moment. So this section's for anything else. So if you're here to publicly comment on something not on the agenda, Feel free to raise your hand, which is at the bottom of the screen, I believe, and then Bridget Doherty is going to manage this process for us. So Bridget, I will ask you if there are any people raising their hands to comment on anything that's not on the agenda. Yes, it looks like we have a person named Michael. And uh, Michael, I have unmuted you so if on your end you need to unmute go for it but michael you have your hand raised yes so the, the, before you start let me just say that um as always you've got the pleasure of the floor for two minutes we do have a timer that you cannot see unfortunately um, but you will hear a beep at the end of those two minutes thank you thank you my only question is on your agenda how does the public exactly know what it is today? That was that's lit, that is uh, posted on our website. Okay, so I would have to look at the website before I could comment on something well, why, that is Michael, not on the agenda. Why don't you tell us what the issue is, and I can tell you if it's on the agenda. Uh, well, one of the things uh, is actually just what's going on the turmoil in our town and all over the country but i really would just like to see the agenda so i could be a little clearer okay so uh, why don't you give me your email address and i can forward those to you each week when i send them to the media and other folks okay well this always will you be doing this on zoom every week <laughs> um we will be doing it like this until further notice Okay. Yeah. My email. My email. Okay. Wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. Maybe, maybe he shouldn't say that out loud. Yeah. Uh, probably true. It won't you? bother me. I mean. Okay. It won't bother me. I mean, it is Ridge Trim, R I D G E, T R I M, at gmail, dot com. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I look forward to the meeting. Thank you. 
Bridget, anyone else? Yes, we have Dr. Franklin Ridgeway with his hand raised. Okay. I'm allowed to talk. Doctor, if on your end you have to unmute, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to make sure that we will have ample opportunity to comment on Commissioner Parks' uh, resolution later in the meeting. That's, that's correct, is it not? Yes, that is part of the public hearing. Thank you. Okay. Bridget? And that appears it for the hands that are up right now. Very good. Okay, we will move on then um, with comments and motions from commissioners. Commissioner Sumro Dumas. Thank you, Madam President. I have a few comments today. Um, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, talk about our small business grant um, and that we did very well as it relates to the grants that were distributed. Of course, we wanted to do uh, better, uh, but some qualified and others didn't. And I was just wondering if we can get a small business grant report, a public report out for the public and for ourselves as it relates to um, how many received grants, um, how many didn't, the criteria and some uh, areas of the criteria that we want to change or alter uh, for our next round. It's my understanding we will be able to do another round because there were monies left over. Um, I see that Holly Chrisman has lit up on the screen. So, okay. Holly, um, I know that we're all interested in kind of a dashboard on all of the different things that have been rolled out, but could you specifically speak to this one? Absolutely, and thank you for the question. Um, we are in the process right now of signing the agreements for all the businesses that, that met the um, criteria and had their forms verified. So I think once we get through that, which is happening as we speak, um, we would definitely love to do a big update to the board. Um, I hope maybe at the next board meeting, as long as we have all the agreements uh, signed by the businesses. Great. Okay. That Thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, secondly, um, I just wanted to give appreciation to my chief of staff, uh, Bishop Bobby Hilton, for coordinating the testing site at Word of Deliverance. We had over 900 people who came out. Uh, to get tested for COVID-19. So he really worked hard. And also, of course, Greg Kesterman helped to coordinate that with the governmental entities in Forest Park. Um, so it was a, a good success and it continues on today in Forest Park on uh, Smiley Road um, in, uh, at Walmart. I also wanted to recognize, um, and I apologize if I say the name wrong, Rhea or Raya Milton, who was a, a transgender woman that was murdered in Butler County. Um, it did receive national attention yesterday. And um, I know there's an effort afoot that I've been receiving lots of emails from her supporters, advocates of transgender and just violence um, that we keep it in the forefront. Um, my understanding they may have caught one person. Uh, there are two other people that they're looking at. And I just want to let uh, the people know that have written me and those that have not, that I will continue to keep it in the forefront as much as I can. Um, this murder happened in Butler County. Um, and in addition, our team will be leading a charge to change Columbus Day, which is in October. Um, I know that Commissioner Boyce uh, did change Columbus Day to Juneteenth. Um, I'm not in favor of Juneteenth. I'm glad that he did that. But um, Indigenous Peoples Day uh, is what uh, the city of Cincinnati changed Columbus Day to. And I don't want to take away something that honors the Indigenous people for African American um, celebration. Um, so I'm moving toward, um, and our team will be moving toward working with the commissioners to make Juneteenth a holiday on June the 19th. I think that's the only right thing to do. Um, and um, you know the pandemic, of course, it's everywhere is raging. Uh, we've given out uh, important numbers and trends, you know, during briefings, and we've talked about the spread and which areas are the hot spots. I have found, uh, even though we've kind of uh, brought it down to three zip codes just lately, that everywhere is raging. Uh, but we've emphasized three different uh, zip codes, so. Um, and I, I say it's not just the numbers. These are people as we, people and families. And we need to uh, make some of the hard, hard choice, choices. I mean, it's easy to, um, and well, it's not easy, 
but it's easier to bring up the numbers. Um, but as we look at them as people, as we do, and we think we just can't continue to say what the numbers are and what the trends are. We have to take some action, be it popular or not. Um, and so I'm in uh, full support of mandating masks um, in public areas. Now, I know we're waiting to hear what the governor is going to say today, um, but the earlier webinar I had uh, this morning indicated that they may have local government sort of make those um, considerations or the rec recommendation. I think we need to make the hard choices, the hard decision that may not be popular, but that masks need to be worn in public areas because it is not impacting them, it's impacting the people that they are around. I had suggested uh, possibly if we can consider, since the National Guard has been involved with the testing sites, maybe the National Guard could go into communities and pass out masks um, to those who do not have them. Who knows, they may or may not wear them, but we're, we're gonna have to step up our efforts, not only testing. And then this is a, uh, I did that I kind of threw around and I submitted, I didn't hear any more about it, um, about incentives, um, incentives for those younger people. And the question is, why why do you have to provide incentives for somebody to, to get tested to see if they're sick? And the answer is because, you know, as a good parent, you're not just supposed to say because, but because they don't think um, it's out there, they think they're not vulnerable, um, I'm thinking that maybe if we give an incentive um, that they um, get tested, um, that this would help the rapid um, progression of this disease. And it's never too late to do the right thing. And when I say the right thing, that goes back to mandating uh, the mask. Lastly, um, we are celebrating this weekend, the 4th of July, or as people call Independence Day. Uh, where the Declaration of Independence was signed on July the 4th. And it says, we hold these truths, which are facts, to be self-evident, which means obvious, that all men, red, yellow, red, black, white, are created equal. No one is better than anyone. And they are endowed, given, by their creator with certain unalienable rights, rights that cannot be taken away, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And at the end, when you talk about changing things, when, what life do you have if you don't have a job, if you don't have affordable housing? What liberty do you have when you don't have freedom, when you're being stopped because of the color of your skin? How can you pursue happiness where you're not thought of as being equal? That's why there is always an ambivalence when it comes to um, supporting 4th of July and Independence Day. It's really funny that at the end of this, we hold these truths because I do my research. At the end of it, it says, if these things are not happening, then it's the responsibility of the people to change the government. And that, to me, that means voting to get other people in that will listen and make sure that this is happening and that people are free. Um, and it's not until all people are free that we will be free. We have to do it together. And that will end my report, Madam, Sec Madam President. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Parks. Thank you, Madam President. Um, Commissioner Summer Dumas, I mm -hmm. totally agree with you. None of us are free mm -hmm. until all of us are free. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's, it's been an exciting week and I am going to uh, hold on comments because I'm looking forward to mm -hmm. getting to public meeting. Great, thank you. Um, I have a couple of things related to COVID-19 as always. Um, I did talk to the health commissioner before we jumped on the meeting, um, he was not available today, um, but he said that the trends that we've been talking about over the last week or so continue, where we've got a dramatic increase in positive cases, 
uh, we are seeing an uptick in hospitalizations and a slight uptick in deaths. And so the concern is that the two last ones, hospitalization or death, are lagging indicators. And so we won't see the result of those positive cases for a couple of weeks following those. So we're keeping a close eye um, on these numbers, on the trends, to make sure that we've got data-driven um, decisions being made uh, in our community. Um, he also talked about the testing sites. So we are um, testing 900 people, as you mentioned, Commissioner, per day um, at all three sites so far. So there has been a tremendous response. Uh, unfortunately, we've even had to turn people away. Um, and so we know that people in this community want to be tested and we need to continue to work to provide um, that capacity. So these pop-ups will uh, continue today. Uh, they're from one to seven. Uh, and I'm gonna read off the sites of where we are today. And Commissioner Dumas, you already said the one today is at Walmart on Smiley Road. Then we pick up on Monday uh, in North College Hill, there's a location, Life Spring Church on Galbraith. On Tuesday, they're gonna be in Delhi at the former Remke on Delhi Pike. And on Wednesday, they're gonna be in Colerain at the Colerain Public Works on Springdale Road. So again, this is a partnership with the um, Ohio uh, National Guard. They've come in, they set up pop-ups. However, um, as was mentioned, the local partners are super important here when it comes to logistics and setting things up and making sure people know about the testing itself. So we've been very grateful to all the communities who have participated so far. Uh, for their help with the coordination, and of course, Greg Kesterman and the team at Public Health for um, helping uh, this be successful. So um, I got tested myself. It took two hours, but it was worth the wait. I don't have my results yet, so I have nothing to report. Um, so as we as we wind down then um, on the pop-up sites, which will wind down next week, we have CARES Act dollars that have been set aside. It's 19 million for testing. And so Holly, um, just as you gave an update related to the small business uh, dollars, can you give us a quick update on where we are with the 19 million for testing? Uh, because one, they kind of fold in together. Um, so help us understand the timing there. Um, thank you, Commissioner um, Driehaus. We are right now negotiating. Um, we have the um, RFPs were due um, last week and I believe it was last week, um, and we are currently negotiating with a vendor and, and drafting that agreement as we speak. Um, so that does take a little bit of time to have those agreements reviewed and negotiated. Um, the RFP did state that um, they would have 30 days to help stand up the program. So we're um, uh, working through that agreement right now. All right, great, thank you. All right. Very good. And, and Greg also, of course, mentioned that um, in addition to testing, it's important that everybody in the community do their part to protect their families, to protect themselves by wearing a mask, practice safe distancing and wash your hands. Um, all the things that we know we need to do. We did it in the beginning. We flattened the curve. Uh, we need to get back to those best practices and do that again to keep everybody safe, uh, particularly as we go into a holiday weekend. So. Um, I think, you know, echoing some of the comments that we've heard over the last couple of days. Um, that's all I have. Um, Madam, Madam President. Yes. Um, I, I just want to say um, the testing is awesome, of course, but I, I feel that we need to make a more aggressive, have more aggressive strategies once you find out. And then those young people that, that say they're not going, I'm not pushing incentives. I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying we need to be more aggressive. Um, and if it means, um, you know, sending the National Guard out because they're willing to help, as I was saying, to hand out masks or um, I think that we need time. The time is now um, not to just do testing, but to get out there and reach the ones we are not reaching. Most of those people in those testing sites are older people. Um, you know, there's some young. But we have to reach those young people who we have said um, they are, I think um, Dwayne would said 37% of hospitalizations or something uh, is young people now. So I think we can't just say testing, and I know we're not just saying testing is good enough. It's not good enough. It's one of our strategies. But what can we do to be more aggressive to reach the ones that we're not reaching? Um, 
that's what that's my concern. And also my concern is, are we as a commission willing to say, uh, if we're given the opportunity by the governor, uh, that masks should be uh, mandated. I, initially, when we were talking about we were open up, opening up everything, the restaurants and everything, I understand the economic impact of all of that, but I was totally against, I just thought it was too soon. And now after foresight and it's happened, what are we gonna do as leaders uh, to, to, to not only do testing, but to do some other strategic things? So that's that's where I am. And you know, we don't we meet every two weeks. So we'll have to wait, you know, in two more weeks to, to decide to do something. So um, it's it's now the time is now. So um, so I have talked to um, Greg Kesterman about this. We don't have the authority to implement um, any kind of policy that mandates masks. The, the city mm -hmm. has home rule, and so they can. Dayton can. Columbus can. The commissioners, though, cannot. Uh, and so that. The, mm -hmm. the health commissioner um, at the county level would have to be allowed by the commissioner at the state level to offer that kind of directive. That has mm -hmm. not happened. And so uh, we, at this moment in time, do not have the authority to mandate masks. Um, I don't know if the governor is heading in that direction or not, but I have uh, made the health commissioner aware and, and, you know, he's talking to his board about, um, you know, whether or not that would be a good option. So I think more to come on that, uh, but we do have to wait until uh, an action from the governor or the, um, the health department director um, at the state level to allow us that kind of authority. Uh, can, and we, it, yes, can we strongly recommend to the health Commissioner, that that is our recommendation uh, to Greg, uh, because as I was saying this morning, they I heard that maybe we're going to be given that opportunity. I'm aware that we can't do it now, but maybe as a commission, we could make a strong recommendation if we're in agreement, um, rather than uh, you know waiting. Um, that's just my concern. Okay, and and the governor says today then. Yeah, yeah, and and I think individually we can all reach out, especially through CCAO. Mm -hmm. um, who is always promoting the policies. So um, okay. I don't remember this specifically being discussed on those calls, and I know we're all three on them, um, mm -hmm. but it might be something to raise at that level too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, thanks. Yeah, um, and, and as far as messaging goes, I agree with you that we need to make sure we're messaging to the entire community and not mm -hmm. just certain segments of the community. And so we've done, mm -hmm. um, and I know Greg Kestrom is pre pretty diligent about reaching out, particularly in the hot spots to the communities most impacted, including young people. So maybe um, if we, we can get him on to talk about those efforts to message out, to make sure that uh, we have young people, uh, people of color, people from the immigrant community, people in these geographic areas, all hearing the message and making sure that they're practicing safe practices and going to get the test. So I, 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 more to come on that too. I know Greg is doing some of that. I just don't have all that information. Okay, thank you. Um, Administrator Aludo. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Um, I actually have um, a few by leave items today, but there's there's a decent number of them, um, and I thought we might want to save these until the end of the meeting, unless there's something that the board wanted to take up now. In terms of uh, just general comments. Um, I just uh, I don't have a whole lot. I know we have a public hearing to get to. Um, I just wanted to thank um, all the uh, county employees for all of their hard work um, over the course of the past couple of months. Hope they have a restful Fourth uh, of July holiday. Uh, I also just wanted to give the board a brief update um, as it relates to uh, Holly uh, gave a nice update on the on the on the testing uh, RFP uh, that we're currently in negotiations on. Um, that is, in fact, uh, our number one priority now is to get that RFP, um, the contract from that RFP negotiated and out the door and on this and, and active uh, with our vendors so that we can move forward with that. Um, I think the more we can, I agree with uh, Commissioner uh, Dumas that it's, it's, not the, it's not the sole um, uh, response strategy, but in order to adequately uh, uh, test contact trace and quarantine it's a huge part of what we need to be doing to make sure that we manage uh the surge uh, that, that we're seeing so that's our number one uh cares act 
uh, priority right now is getting that contract done. But we also do have, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the implementation of the small business program uh, that we're rolling out. We have uh, the, the rental assistance program uh, that we are in the process of, of, uh, of, of standing up, as well as a program to help uh, with some of the pandemic daycares uh, that uh, were charged with, day, uh, with, with uh, child care services um, during, especially for first responders and essential businesses over the course of the governor's stay at home order uh, that uh, we wanna make sure are fully reimbursed for their costs so that we don't lose child care and daycare centers as we, uh, as the economy reemerges and we have people going back to work, uh, especially. And that's obviously also in addition to uh, all the personal protective equipment uh, work that we continue to do um, and getting dollars out the door uh, for, um, uh, for communities through our local government assistance program. And uh, on that note, uh, we did receive the dollars, the House Bill 41 dollars from the state. And as the county auditor receives resolutions from communities indicating that they're uh, willing to abide by the terms of the CARES Act, they are being forwarded um, their House Bill for $81. Uh, the county's money, we are um, continuing to reserve. We want to get that money out, money out as quickly as we can, but we're trying to check some final boxes as it relates to uh, the communication that's been going back and forth between the Department of Treasury uh, and the interpretation with Ohio's, uh, uh, Ohio's budget, man budget Management Office and the Auditor of State to make sure that as we get these dollars to the communities that we've received, um, that we are clear with communities on how they are allowed to use that. And we've gotten some recent guidance on it um, uh, to, that, uh, to that end, but we wanna make absolutely sure that we are providing communities with um, effective and uh, accurate guidance on that so that they're using the money uh, in accordance with the rules that we're being held accountable for. Uh, so those are the, the general comments I have. Madam President, I'll defer to you in terms of how you'd like to handle the, uh, the by-leaves for today. Yeah, I think we should hold on the by-leaves so that we can get to the public hearing. So, so I've already flipped the page. No offense, Jeff. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> moving on. Uh, but appreciate the patience there. Um, all right. So we've got two public hearings for today. Um, with um, your approval, uh, fellow commissioners, I'd like to flip these and do the hearing to consider a resolution declaring racism a public health crisis. Make that the first public hearing so that we can get to that uh, and then leave the road fund uh, hearing for second. Is that okay? All right, let's, so let's do that. So we're going to roll into then. I will move to open the public hearing to consider a resolution declaring racism a public health crisis. Second. Mr. House. Yes. Mr. Samadumas. Yes. Mr. Park. Yes. Thank you. All right, um, so Commissioner Parks, I know you've got some folks who have joined that were um, part of getting the resolution together. I guess they were kind of a sounding board, really. Um, I didn't know if you wanted them to be part of kind of the initial presentation, and then we would get to the public comment section. Um, that sounds like a good idea, but Madam President, I can't tell who's on here and who's oh. not. <laughs> right. So uh, so if you, if you are on the, your screen. Uh -huh. the, okay. Uh, so, right so I, I, I do see some people and um, I see Commissioner Kevin Boyce, who is from Franklin County. Yeah. Um, so he is on, I would love for him to speak. And uh, um, I, I just don't see anybody else, but if they're so, here, they, they are definitely invited. Okay, very good. So uh, let's move then to Commissioner Boyce. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman, President uh, Driehaus. So good to see you again, and certainly uh, to the Hamilton County Board of Commissioners. I'm grateful to be back before you again. I'm sorry, I do have to run, so I'm going to be really quick, uh, but I want to just congratulate you. Um, uh, when Commissioner Parks approached me about the work that we were doing in Franklin County, um, I shared with her initially the background to how we arrived at the conclusion that racism was a public health crisis. In 2018, um, we embarked on a mission to re analyze Franklin County in looking at poverty. Franklin County was growing in so many ways. Uh, our unemployment rate was at uh, below 4%. It 
and uh, you could see cranes in the sky just about everywhere you went in throughout Franklin County. But we also noticed that poverty was growing very deeply in many parts of the county too. And so as we drilled down to figure out what the real issues were with why our poverty rates were growing as, as we were thriving, um, the number one issue across all elements of quality of life measurement from um, health, access to quality and affordable health care to wealth distribution, access to affordable housing, uh, the underlying premise uh, to those uh, disparate numbers was race. And I want to just read to you from the report that um, we worked with several consultants to generate uh, this racial uh, conclusion that um, the racial element that concluded um, our steps. And, and I'll, I'll be real quick about it. It says, in taking a frank assessment of poverty in Franklin County, the steering committee identified and prioritized the need to be candid and direct about the historic and current role <clears throat> that race and racial inequities play in perpetual poverty. And that's important. The steering committee held thoughtful discussions and about public policies that have continued to impact communities of color in Franklin County. And it reviewed how data and property indicators demonstrate those impacts. Again, these are underlying issues. Uh, this led to the committee members understanding that if real change were to take place, if real change were to take place, there must be an effort to disrupt the institutional racism and unconscious bias that continue to permeate throughout Franklin County. The steering committee recognized that facing the challenge of racial inequities in the country in the county will require a sustained effort to engage and change. And then it goes on to list what those um, uh, items are. So, and the reason why I, I, I wanted to read this because in reading, and, and I've been a part of probably no less than 50 or 60 uh, resolution declarations across the country now. And, and I gotta say, I think Hamilton County's is one of the most well thought, um, um, broad scope, uh, and focused effort that I've seen. And I wanna just congratulate uh, Commissioner Parks because I'm telling you, when, when I say how dedicated and focused she was on this conversation, we spent the better part of a year pulling back these layers and looking at this. And, and she was able to do the work and the research uh, in a few weeks. And I think that really, and it's, it's equivalent to what we did, uh, quite frankly. And, and your staff, Jeff and Sonia, and, and so many others in Hamilton County, I think have invested in this in the right way. And so I'm here to simply congratulate Hamilton County for taking a step. You, you have a history of uh, like challenges like many of us do. And it's clear to me, the leadership at Hamilton County has started a new chapter. And, and that's the most important part. And I hope that uh, the public comments you hear today are in support of that and share with you even more of the rich history uh, and need to understand this inequity um, to enhance the work that you're doing. So thanks so much for having me. I, I do have to run. I'm so sorry. A little late for another event. Um, but I'll take any questions if you, if you want. Well, great to see you, Commissioner Boyce. Thank you for your comments and for all your sage advice. Um, anybody else? Um, Commissioner, if, Commissioner Boyce, um, I have said it many times that uh, you, you were so helpful to me and it was your it was your um resolution that lit a fire under me uh in, in matter of fact i don't know if people realize that you submitted this you you proclaimed this before the death of george uh george george floyd <laughs> and uh and, and just i read it and i was just so motivated and so inspired and so I, I called you and I was probably screaming, like, mm -hmm. what? So I, I just want to thank you for all of your help and your guidance. Thank Absolutely. You. I'm, I stand with Hamilton County. So thank you. I got to run. I'll yep. see you all. Thank you so much. Thanks, thank Commissioner. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Victoria, do you want to um, give us just an overview of what the resolution does? And then we'll go into public comment. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. I'd like that, Madam President. Um, when we talk about this, I have pulled out three main points mm -hmm. of it. Uh, the, the first thing is that Hamilton County um, proclaims, you know, not just me, it is the, and the commissioners, it is the health commissioner who, um, who, who was really awesome in this. And uh, 
So if, if you don't mind, I would like to read the very first paragraph mm -hmm. of the resolution. And it says, whereas public health is the science of protecting and improving the health of people, entire populations, and their communities. Public health professionals try to prevent problems from happening or recurring through implementing educational programs, recommending policy, administering services, and limiting health disparities through the promotion of equitable and accessible health care. So I am going to go to the second. It says, whereas Racism and segregation in Ohio, in Hamilton County, have exacerbated a health divide resulting in black Ohioans having lower life expectancies than white Ohioans, being far more than, than other races to die prematurely and to die of heart disease or stroke. And, um, and then we go into infant mortality and so on and just the lack of education, the disparities in health care, so on and so forth. But what we highlight in this resolution are three main points. Number one is we propose expanded training for Hamilton County employees. And with this, in collaboration with the commissioners, um, Hamilton County Sheriff Jim Neal has committed to enhanced training that Hamilton County employees under the Board of Commissioners will also receive to identify biases, prevent harm and wrongdoing. In addition, the Sheriff's Office will benchmark its policies and procedures and has committed to install a culture of ethical and courageous behavior. Um, so if, if I can drill down into that a little bit, we got this uh, method of policing from the New Orleans Police Department. And they call it EPIC, E-P-I-C, which stands for Ethical Policing <laughs> is Courageous. I just love that. Mm -hmm. um, and to give you an example of what that is, is, um, for example, when George Floyd was murdered, had the Minneapolis Police Department had this training, the other officers would not have watched Chauvin leave his knee on that man's neck. Um, they, they would have stopped it. And, and here, here's our best example. During that first wave of protests after George Floyd's murder, we actually saw, I think it was in Seattle or Phoenix, where uh, the, the, the police had a, um, a protester one had his upper body, the other had the lower body. They put him down and, and, and handcuffed him. The police that had the upper body of the protester put his knee on his neck. And what we saw on television was the other policeman push him off. He tapped him out, get off of him. Um, so I would like to think he did it because he cared about the humanity of the victim. But if he didn't, he cared about his partner. And in the end, he, th there was no harm done. So these, so, so, so we like that. And the, the Sheriff's Department has um, committed to go to New Orleans and receive train the trainer um, training, train the trainer training. And um, in addition, we will place that same training over the entire county where we want a culture where nobody watches somebody do something wrong. So this, this pertains to a county. It pertains to the prosecutor's office. It will pertain to JFS, where we will not tolerate um, unfairness, um, um, in, in, in unethical behavior. So looking forward to that. Um, number two, we are um, in this resolution, I propose the expansion of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and we are changing the name to uh, include equity. So it will be the Office of Diversion, Inclusion and Equity. Um, so 
you know, Robert Bell, who is the director, um, is what he does right now, and he does a great job as a one man office, is to ensure that Hamilton County's policies of inclusion in our um, procurement, in our hiring processes, training, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so he does it by himself. It's a big job. We're going to expand that to, um, to promote cultural engagement within the Hamilton County community with a focus on connecting vulnerable minority and poverty stricken communities of Hamilton County to, res to resources within and outside of our county capable of addressing the needs of these communities and more effectively connecting these communities to the work and programming of the county. So that's an overview of those two. And the big one is that we are going to conduct a disparity study in Hamilton County. Um, uh, we commit to conduct an economic disparity study to determine whether iniquities exist in economic outcomes related to county procurement affecting minorities and women, and if so, to commit solutions to remedying those inequalities. So, so that's that's the overview. I, I could talk about this all day, but let's get started. <laughs> all right, very good. And before we get started, Commissioner Sumer, do Miss, do you have any comments? Um, just a couple comments. Um, of course, uh, racism is a public health crisis. We know that. Um, it's also a housing crisis. Racism impacts mental health, social, economic, educational, and political. Racism is in the political system. And so um, this definitely needs to be done. And who am I to, to try to uh, I guess my concern was racism is a public health crisis, which it is, but do we need to include everything else in it? And I'm not here to stop it. I'm here to start it, to move it forward. And um, I know some of those elements are inside of the resolution. Um, so I'm in, for, in, in favor of this resolution. Thank you. Uh, and I will say briefly, thank you to uh, especially Commissioner Parks for bringing this forward. I too stand in support, I especially like um, the expansion of the Office of Inclusion and the disparity study and the long term uh, training and some of the other things that you've included. Um, very important work. Thank you so much for doing it. Um, so let's now go to public comment. Bridget Darty. I am going to rely on you to tell us whose hands are raised and then uh, you can unmute them so we can hear their comments. And a reminder, everybody, you've got two minutes. Uh, you'll hear the beep uh, as the two minutes concludes, but we wanna thank you for being on, for offering your comment. Commissioner Parks has said this more than once, this is a draft document. So we are anxious to hear your ideas and your comments to the resolution. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. We have a, several hands raised. Barbara Perez is also on video. So I'll send it over to her first. Great. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank mm -hmm. you for Good letting afternoon. me speak. So I really, I just want to commend the work um, of Commissioner Parks. And fortunately, the YWCA was able to provide input um, as the resolution was being drafted. So um, just want everyone to know that we heartily endorse this resolution. Um, uh, we are a 152-year-old organization that has been focused on eliminating racism, empowering women, and promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. And so we wanna partner with you and work on this for the betterment of our community. I will tell you that we took a, a lead from uh, Franklin County as well. And so on Monday, a letter is going out to hundreds of area businesses asking them to endorse this resolution. Oh. We are also sending it out to the nonprofit community. So we hope to, they had 1200 organizations endorse their resolution. We're hoping to beat that. So we, we are trying to help support you so that when you go for the vote, the week of the 13th, that you have the full support of the community. 
Oh, Barbara, thank you so much. That's a surprise. Yeah. I, I, I really appreciate your uh, your support, your encouragement, and in partnership. Thank you. Well, let's hope the business community and the nonprofit community steps up. We do. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bridget. Okay, next up we have Dr. Franklin Ridgeway. Uh, I'm going to ask you to unmute. And then after him, we have Herschel Daniels, and then James and Nadine Allen, you're on base. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Franklin Ridgeway, and I am an adjunct professor at the University of Cincinnati and a member of Socialist Alternative. And I am speaking today on behalf of the Housing Justice Coalition. First of all, I want on my own behalf to voice my support for Commissioner Parks's resolution and urge that permanent and substantive measures be taken in Hamilton County to address its endemic inequities of race, especially in the areas of education, public transportation, city planning, health care, and public safety. On behalf of our coalition, I would like to draw the attention of the commissioners to the current local and nationwide eviction crisis, a crisis that promises to put masses of poor and working class people on the streets in the middle of a pandemic. Here, in rapidly gentrifying Cincinnati, landlords are filing eviction actions en masse as tens of thousands of renters are still waiting for unemployment benefits and stimulus checks. Meanwhile, COVID-19 cases are skyrocketing in Hamilton County with no diminution in sight. Moreover, while the county's eviction help center has provided needed but limited assistance to defendants in eviction cases, many landlords are turning down rental assistance funds, preferring to put their tenants in the streets in the middle of a de deadly health emergency. Most of those evicted are black and almost all are poor. Therefore, the Housing Justice Coalition demands an immediate end to the processing of eviction claims and the serving of eviction notices by bailiffs for the duration of the health crisis. We demand in the name of racial justice and public health that the commission hold public online hearings on the housing and eviction crisis in Hamilton County by August. We demand the county act in the interest of the broad masses of people, not only those of the landlord. If the county really considers racism a public health crisis, then it needs to treat mass eviction like, the, like an emergency and stop, pressing the, uh, pro, stop processing them immediately. Let me also say in closing, I'd like to express my gratitude to Commissioner Dumas for speaking up to our trans brothers and sisters, especially since we have seen some very wretched and horrifying uh, acts of violence against uh, black trans women in the past few weeks. So once again, thank you very much, Commissioner Dumas. Thank you. And thanks Thank you. to all of the commissioners. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Up next is Herschel Daniels. Yes. As a member of the U.S. Human Rights Network. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So as a member of the African Scientific Institute, with over 1,500 members. As a member of the U.S. Human Rights Network, who on June 19th participated in the United Nations in calling uh, for the addressing as a special session uh, for the issue of human rights violation in reference to police brutality. And as a speaker previously on the 2015 21st Century Police Force of President Obama, uh, we are proposing uh, the creation of the public-private partnership, in fact, that would be able to draw on the over uh, $2.3 trillion that has been put on the street relative right now through the Federal Reserve. That public-private partnership built on last year, on Juneteenth, Todd Pertoon's push for the county to address institutional systematic racism. In my comments written to you, I give the background on this, but we are now in the process of actualizing over $150 billion worth of bank-based community benefit agreements, 30 billion of which come from Fifth Third. We have the means to do this right now, not real soon now, right now. 
and the law allows us to do this, and but the county must take in consideration uh, this in terms of when you classify it as a health uh, crisis, is it in DSM? Is it in, okay, uh, how are you defending it? Uh, two, have you set aside the money for the legal suit? Three, have you put together the standard operating procedure when the racist says, hey, I have a uh, medical condition? And four, uh, how are you dealing with this in terms of putting in place uh, the disparity study to make sure that uh, the entities such as the banks and uh, the Port Authority are covered? Do not do just the county, but the county entities in itself. We look forward to working with you to put the strongest one in place because the United States is being judged on its human rights and Hamilton County is the center point. We did this last year as we entered Todd's uh, uh, proclamation with you, Commissioner Treehouse and Dumas and him. It is in the United Nations and it's due for review November 9th. We thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have James and Nadine. James and Nadine, if you need to look at your screen and unmute yourself, but you are, you have the floor. Maybe we'll come back to you, James and Nadine. Uh, Rena Saperstein. Rena, take a look and see if you are able to speak. I am here. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi. Thank you, commissioners. This is Rena Saperstein. I'm speaking on in support of the resolution representing Caracol, our community's AIDS services organization. Caracol works closely with Hamilton County Department of Health. We see race, racism, and racial disparities as a risk factor for disease where consistently Black and Latinx Americans see worse health consequences than white Americans. The factors that one needs to stay healthy, stable housing, transportation, access to medical care, healthy food, confidence in community structures, and the respect for and from the medical system, all are disparate for Black Americans, all affecting health. Factors making people sicker, stigma, poverty, homelessness and housing instability, incarceration, all are dispor disproportionate by race in Hamilton County. So uh, we sent you, uh, Commissioner Park, some, some data on that. We stand ready to work together with the county and community partners to address racism as a public health issue, systemically and over the long term. So thank you for raising the issue. Thank you, Rena. Thank you. Thank you, Rena. Thank you, Rena. Let's try James and Nadine one more time. James and Nadine, you are unmuted on my end. They're muted on their end. Okay. Well, we have up next Nightmare, and then after Nightmare, we have Tanya Price and then June Hill Cable. So Nightmare, you are unmuted on my end. Hello, all. How you doing? Uh, my name is Christopher Mayer, um, grandson of the great Walt Mayer, and I, I wanted to get in touch. You know, Denise, I've known you for a long time, and there are a whole lot of people out here that are very upset about what is going on here. Ms. Parks has received zero votes in this county, and we are being asked to fund racism as a public health crisis now the democratic party has been in charge of this county for a very long time and expanding the already failed policies clearly does not seem like the best way to go about this i don't know anyone at all that is racist in this county not one person it never comes up in my in our conversations i have friends of all races I was a United States Marine. If you want to talk about racism, you should try living in Eastern Europe or going to the Middle East and fighting pointless wars. That's racism. People are killed for being Christian, for being black, for being against their government. 
I understand that you all have issues right now and you're being reactionary. I get it. I understand. The video of George Floyd is horrible. Everybody condemns it. Everybody's on the same page. But when I hear Ms. Dumas quoting the Declaration of Independence and then arbitrarily saying that Columbus Day is going to be removed, that stuff, that's not, that's not how you do business. I'm a taxpayer in this county. You don't just make public decrees. And I, I hear all these people. I mean, you had a socialist on the phone earlier and no one challenged him. Socialism doesn't work, y'all. I'm telling you, I've lived in it. And I beg you, just please tone down the rhetoric so we can live in peace again. This county is way better than most, but we will be absolutely destroyed within one year. And Ms. Denise, you know it. I called your office and told you a pandemic was coming in December. No one responded to me in January. I'm a member of the Intel community and I try to help you all out, but please, please just help us out just a little bit. Tone the rhetoric down. A public health crisis for racism is not the answer. And you're more than welcome to go ahead with it, but you're gonna bankrupt us all. And then all the people that live here and all the businesses are gonna leave. Please don't do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, up next we have Tanya Price. You are unmuted on my end. Good afternoon. Good my afternoon. name, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, hello. My name is uh, Tanya Price. I'm an anthropology professor, former yeah. Black Studies professor. And um, I after teaching for many years, I returned to Cincinnati to be near my family. And I would just like to say that I strongly report, uh, support this resolution. I just have a couple of concerns I'd like to mention. Um, first of all, I want to know, is this um, primarily an aspirational document? Or are you going to have um, a means to um, actually implement this? Is it enforceable? Um, like for instance, I noticed the, the last paragraph, it doesn't have very strong language. It has, be it further resolved that the Hampton County BOCC encourages all community leaders and stakeholders in health, education, employment, housing, criminal justice, and safety arenas to recognize racism as a public health crisis and to implement portions of all of the declaration and to take these actions that they can to promote equity within the Hampton County community. And now um, it doesn't say require. And I wonder if, um, I'm, I'm not sure what the um, actual jurisdiction of the Hampton County commissioners are, you know, on the ground, but I was wondering if this can be actually enforceable because right now we're in a very profound moment right now and everybody's very passionate. But as the days and weeks of us go, uh, go on, are we actually going to be able to implement this? Thank you. Thank you. I'll take that. Thanks. Um, Ms. Price, thank you for your comments. Um, what took us so long was that this is not a symbolic document. We will be able to do it. The last paragraph that you brought up, we, we can't mandate that uh, businesses or anybody else do anything. What mm -hmm. we can do with, within our jurisdiction is to do what we have said in this resolution. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have June Hill Cable, followed by Kevin Minus. June, you are unmuted on my end. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Yes, yes. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I have to commend uh, Commissioner Parks for taking this bold step. I am four, four generations of living in the city of Cincinnati. And I personally have experienced racism from the county and the city level. I have fought for in, against injustices 
and I will continue to fight against injustices because I do believe that that Hamilton County is like no other county because of the systemic racism that that I know is like embedded into our culture here. It's institutionalized in every fabric of our of our county, city and county. It's like an, a horrible aura. Whenever you go into city offices or county offices, it's like it's 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 a feeling you get. You don't you don't feel that this is a culture that doesn't judge you by the color of your skin, and that how you're how you are treated is based on the color of your skin. And every fabric of our of our within this county is there. And the gentleman that spoke two calls back, he has blinders on. He's he's one of the people that is going to fight against us improving our city and our county for the next generation. Because my hope is that my granddaughter and that my daughter will not experience what I experienced, what my mother's experienced, what my grandmother experienced, what my, what my great grandmother experienced living in the city of Cincinnati and the county of Hamilton. So I applaud you, Mrs. Parks, and I would hope that you get people from all walks of life coming together, speaking honestly about this issue, and that we will pr improve this county once and for all to help all of us live in a better place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have Kevin Minus, followed by Danielle. Kevin, you are unmuted on our end. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, I am arguing that um, I support the the uh, the declaration, the public declaration. I do have some questions, though, about the language. Um, I'd like to know why the word equity was used and not empowerment, because um, we don't just need to be treated fairly. We need to be made whole and restored first. So it, there's no point of just simply treating someone equally if you're not going to restore them to the place where they need to go. Um, the second thing I'd like to know is um, the metrics. Uh, is the metric simply going to be using the black, white, um, let's just say wealth and um, other um, statistics as the, the metric for improvement or decline, or will there be other metrics as well? Um, uh, I have another question that I, slash comment. Um, is there something that will be gained by doing an additional impact study that wasn't gained by using the studies from like the Urban League, um, just as an example? Um, as recently as 2017, we had a racial analysis studies that were done and we could sort of see the differences in outcomes between uh, the races. Um, I mean, I'm just checking my time, sorry, I've got 30 seconds. Um, also, uh, will there be any sort of investigation to uh, universal basic income or federal, or I guess county go jobs guarantee or state jobs guarantees as a way to minimize the uh, wealth gap between the races? And uh, finally, let me just repeat what I said. I do support it. I, I do have some questions and I'd like to see um, a lot of improvements come out of the, the resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minus. Um, you, you bring up very interesting points. Um, I, I, I would like for you to email my office and so we can speak offline. Would, would you mind doing that? Yeah, I've got your information. I'll message you in a few moments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Next up is Danielle, followed by Annabella Arbriast. Uh, Danielle, you are unmuted on my end. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. So I just wanted to say that I support uh, racism as a public health crisis and full support of it. Um, as we know that you know, racism is systemic and it is embedded into every aspect of our society. I mean, I feel like there is nothing that a black person can do to sort of get away from the systemic racism that we face on a daily basis. I mean, there's just marginal difference between a person of color that has a lot of money. You could have millions of dollars and still not 
be able to get fair treatment. And so I want to just echo what people have said about uh, being in support of this and sort of um, getting to a place where we can have better equal treatment in society. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Annabella Arbogast, you are unmuted on my end. And following Annabella, we'll go back and try James and Nadine. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Annabelle Arbogast, and I'm a resident of Cincinnati in connection with the resolution to declare racism a public health crisis, which includes a number of very important and overdue provisions. I would call the commissioner's attention to the fact that in Hamilton County, evictions are one of the mechanisms through which a long legacy of racism from gentrification to underinvestment and affordable housing produces significant economic and health disparities. Uh, COVID-19 has only exacerbated these disparities and evictions, which disproportionately impact Black residents of Hamilton County, make it difficult or impossible for individuals and families to take the necessary precautions to reduce the spread of the virus. Um, moving forward with evictions in this context, with cases of COVID-19 on the rise and pandemic unemployment assistance set to expire while many remain out of work, contributes to racial inequities in Hamilton County and is a form of violence. And stating an eviction moratorium in Hamilton County is therefore not only an urgent public health issue, but also an urgent racial justice issue. Uh, while the resolution under consideration outlines important steps to be taken toward longer term systemic solutions, immediate action is also needed to prevent a deepening of the housing crisis in Hamilton County. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I, let me just weigh in just very quickly. I don't Holly, I don't remember if we mentioned this um, when we were talking about the CARES Act dollars. We have allocated dollars to help with eviction prevention uh, for those that are facing eviction, knowing that the courts were going to open up again. Um, so we are engaged in that space. I, I don't know if it was said earlier, but I do want to let folks know this evictions come up a couple of times here. Uh, and so we are trying to help in collaboration with AFTAB Pierbong, Greg Landsman, and the Help Center to try to uh, inject some uh, investment uh, to try to keep people in their homes. I just want to offer that. I don't know if we said it at the top of the meeting. Um, all right, so Bridget, do we have one more person? We do. Our last is James and Nadine. Hi. James and Nadine, you are unmuted on my end. And we are going to try them one last time to see if they come through. Okay. Right. Sorry about that, James and Nadine. Um, <laughs> uh, but that concludes our hands that are raised in the chat. Okay, great. Thank you. That I that went pretty well. Uh, <laughs> very well organized, Bridget. Thank you for everyone on the that was our first time doing that. So thank you, Bridget, so much for helping us organize that and all the people behind the scenes um, who helped Bridget help us do that. So um, I um, so if, Commissioner Parks, um, so we've heard some public comment. Can you talk to us a little bit now about the timing and what your expectation is? Yes, thank you, Madam President. Um, what I look forward to doing, what, what, the, what the vision is, what my plan is, is that we will um, discuss these comments. Uh, there, there was some really interesting things uh, brought forth today and um, look at where we will implement them. And if, if anybody on here, if you will be so kind to contact my office. Um, and we will revise the, we, we will revise it and then submit it again the week of July 13th. Um, and that's the week where we, we will have a staff meeting on the, four, on the yeah, on the 14th and a board meeting on the 16th. So, so maybe we will bring forth mm -hmm. the revised edition on during the staff meeting and then vote okay. on it that Thursday. Okay, all right. We will add that to the staff meeting agenda then on the 14th mm -hmm. with the expectation that we pass a final on the 16th. Or vote on it, yeah. Yes, okay. All right, great, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, we have another- Hi, uh Oh, yes. Uh, Madam President, could I just make a just a short comment? 
on a comment that was made earlier by a resident which indicated um, just haphazardly talking about Columbus Day and getting rid of it or whatever. First of all, I don't have that power. Uh, the whole commission would have to agree. And secondarily, uh, before I bring anything forth, I research it. And um, the history shows that Christopher Columbus raped and pillaged the people and the land uh, when he came here. Uh, did not discover America because people were already here. So I want to make that very clear. I don't have the power to do it, and I have researched it to bring up the suggestion. And also, I think uh, Mr. Uh, Herschel Daniels mentioned about the businesses and making sure we include them in the study. But I just really asked the businesses about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, uh, maybe not the, June on Juneteenth today, um, to let me know uh, how they planned on recognizing Juneteenth or and or Martin Luther King Day. Let me know how you're working on it, what your thoughts are, if you're going to do anything. And I have not heard from one business. And that's very um, disheartening um, that, um, and maybe they've been busy, I don't know, but just to write or drop a note to say that this is important to us and we plan on doing something about it. So I'm in encouraging all the businesses that may be listening to, to go in and do that, because that's part of the whole racism issue that we're talking about. If it's important to you, it should be important to me. So that's all I have, Madam President. Thank you. All right, we are gonna, oh, I'm gonna move to close this public hearing. Second. Andrea House. Yes. Commissioner Samuel Dumas. Yes. Commissioner Parks. Yes. Thank you. All right, we've got a second public hearing. I'm gonna move to open the hearing to consider the 2020 Municipal Road Fund Program. Second. Commissioner Driehaus? Yes. Commissioner Salman Dumas? Yes. Commissioner Parks? Yes. All right, so Eric Beck is with us. Eric, could you talk to us about the Municipal Road Fund Program? Sure, thank you. Uh, appreciate the, uh, the, the time, Commissioners. Um, this is the uh, a program that's run by the county engineer's office uh, that uh, distributes license plate fees that are collected from motor vehicles with inside municipalities. Uh, we have a process where we accept applications. The, the projects that are presented in front of you today, uh, the applications were last calendar year, last fall. Um, our office rated those in the list we are presenting to you with uh, uh, 21 projects submitted, and we are asking uh, for the top 12 to be approved for funding for uh, this round of MRF funds. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there any questions or comments? I have no questions or comments. I have none, thank you. Very good. Um, Bridget, do we have anybody that is interested in commenting related to this public hearing? Um, Herschel Daniels has his hand raised. Herschel, uh, you are unmuted. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. So in the road funds, especially seeing that the passage of uh, issue seven and funds like this is a key component of economic stability that black firms have been uh, cut out of since the beginning. Uh, these type of funds have been put together. And so when you talk about the disparity study, you must cover offices like the engineer's office, which has been a systematic institutional office of racism relative to uh, participation by black con. Thank you. Um, Eric, could you talk to us here a little bit about that process? Um, sure. Currently, we do not have any sort of set asides on the bidding on these. These are all done through competitive bids when these projects go out. These will all be done. Uh, these projects will not be let by the engineer's office. The funds will go to the municipalities for them to bid. Um, a majority of these, looking at the list, are um, the funds that they're asking for are being used to uh, in conjunction as matching funds on, it looks like other funded funded projects, funding from other sources for the project to use as local funds. 
but these funds are administered by the, the local municipality. Okay. As Thank I you. was saying before. So, Herschel, let, are, Her, Herschel, hold on a minute. So that said, there are opportunities for this commission to weigh in on what you're referring to, as we have through Robert Bell and the Office of Inclusion, trying to uh, make sure that not only are uh, minority businesses aware of the projects that we put out to bid, but they also feel welcome to bid on those. So you are correct to say that the disparity study then opens up um, a, a different avenue for us to make sure that there is inclusion uh, when it comes to some of these projects. And it doesn't sound like these these aren't let by us, so it sounds a little bit different, but point taken that um, you know, the disparity study will offer us a different way of doing business in the future. This is why it's included in the resolution. So. Appreciate your comments on that. All right. Um, is there anybody else, Bridget, that would like to speak to this? Or is there any, anything in the chat? No. There is not. No hands are raised, and I do not see any comments. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, are we comfortable closing this hearing? Yes. yes. Okay. I will move then that we close the hearing to consider the 2020 Mus Municipal Road Fund Program. Second. Commissioner Driehaus? Yes. Commissioner Samuel Dumas? Yes. Commissioner Parks? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, County Engineer, for walking us through that. Um, so you have a lot of regular agenda items in front of us as well. So items one through six are uh, under your purview. So could you walk us through these? Sure, thank you. Um, first, I would like to um, withdraw item number six. We did find some uh inconsistencies in that uh commissioner sumero dumas uh pointed them out to me yesterday and i appreciate that uh went back and reviewed it and I'd, we'd like to pull number six for right now okay uh, give us a time to review that um number one is resolution for um taking appropriations on a right-of-way take for kugel mill project um talking to our right-of-way agent it will probably not go to uh, appropriations, but this is the next step to, uh, to get it there. I believe that will settle on its own. Um, item number two is an extension uh, for additional engineering service on a proposed improvement to Shady Lane and Bridgetown in uh, Miami Township uh, for additional engineering to do the right of way work. Items three is the uh, accepting the lowest and best bid for the 2000 or 2020 resurfacing program. Uh, our engineer's estimate was at 2.8 and the, uh, the bids came in at 2.6 million. So that's good. Bids are coming in lower than we anticipated. Item four is our sidewalk contract. Uh, low bidder was uh, dad's Bobcat service at $61,150. And number five is our uh, 2020 guardrail program uh, lowest bidder was uh, Lake Erie Construction at 227000 Very good. Uh, any comments or questions to these items? No questions. Thank you, Eric, for getting back with me. You're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No questions. Thank you. All right. In that case, I'm going to move that we approve of regular agenda items one through five. Second. Commissioner Driehaus? Yes. Commissioner Dumas? Yes. Commissioner Parks? Yes. Thank you. Uh, we will pull item number six. Thank you, Eric. Um, the rest of the items on the regular agenda are related to MSD items seven through eight through nine. Uh, Jack Rennekamp is on the line. Hello, Jack. Nice background. <laughs> All right. Help us understand these. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Jack Rennekamp with MSD. Uh, with me, of course, is uh, Director Christie. Oh, I didn't. Oh, I see her. Mm -hmm. Director uh, Welsh and uh, two engineers. Uh, Mr. Spadari and Mr. Burkhart, who can assist if you have any specific technical questions to right. item seven, eight, and nine. So items, item seven is a, a request to amend the 2020 through 2024 uh, CI, MSD CIP project to um, increase the programmatic contingency element of that um, CIP uh, by $2.8 million from $5 million to $7.8 million. Um, this request is is based upon a discussion between uh, the county's 
administration and county team for MSD as well as uh, in order to provide sufficient funding for the balance of 2020 for programmatic contingency. Uh, the programmatic contingency allowance, which has been part of the MSD CIP since 2012, um, provides needed funds to cover such contingencies um, for all legislative projects, such as supplemental design uh, uh, costs and expenses and additional construction costs. Um, and it's available to all MSD capital projects that uh, whether they're mandated under the federal consent decree or they're considered to be asset management projects. Um, so the current request again is to amend the CIP um, for exhibit A, B and the PC um, and to um, increase the total amount of the CIP to $69 million of the appropriated funds. As you know, each year, there are appropriated funds assigned to those uh, specific exhibits. Um, and this will increase it by $2.8 million to $69 million. Okay. Items eight and nine, I'm going to uh, combine together for your convenience because they both address um, assessment sewer projects. Um, and an assessment sewer project, my, my mistake, it's for Union Cemetery Road local sewer, which is located in Sims Township and affects the uh, properties, single family properties and one vacant parcel um, that is owned by the township, uh, addressed from 9310 to 9350 um, on Union Cemetery Road. This request stems from a petition by the affected property owners. 100% um, all four agree to request your board to um, proceed forward with design funding as well as construction and, and final assessment um, to build a local sewer that will benefit their property that will connect to an, is, an existing sanitary sewer um, that is in the area. This is also project will also um, basically complete public sewer service to that area. These are the last four properties uh, served by the outfall sewer that they'll connect to. Um, and there are no other properties within the area that can be served by that sewer. So this will basically take care of uh, a quadrant or a portion of, of Union Cemetery Road that is unsewered. And then I wanted to talk about uh, cost. Um, the current request to your board is uh, $16,500 for design funding. Um, the total project cost is $316,000 estimated right now. That's a tentative amount, of course. Um, but I would like uh, the project manager and engineer, Aaron Burkhart, to talk to you a bit about um, what this means. Afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Aaron Burkhart, project manager, MSD. Uh, when we do these projects, we will assess parcels uh, once we have a final project cost, so once Contractors pay, designs done, all the final bills are in. Uh, as you know, part of our rules and regs have a maximum $12,000 assessment per parcel. Uh, so in this case, four parcels would have a maximum assessment of 48,000 amongst the four, uh, which is about 15% of the total project cost at this point, at this estimate. Uh, MSD would end up paying for uh, the remaining uh, cost. So that runs down to about 68,000, 67,000 per parcel uh, that MSD ends up paying for. Um, over time, we've noticed that the amount that ratepayers are paying as a percentage of cost for these projects has decreased. Um, just a matter of things getting more expensive as time goes on, uh, but just something to make the commissioners aware of. Thank you. Um, Director Christie, do you have anything to add? I see that you've popped up. No, I just wanted to be prepared in case there were questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Holly Chrisman to weigh in. I, okay. For Holly. Holly, are you on? Uh, Commissioner, Holly's not on the line. Okay. Uh, at this point, okay. she had, uh, had to jump off of, of the call. Um, but okay. uh, the administration... So um, does support advancing um, each of each of these projects. So if there's any specific questions, um, we can uh, just look for answers to the specific questions, but in general, the administration is supportive of advancing these. Okay, yeah, Holly did send a memo out, I get, I think it was last night, Correct. Um, that talked about these projects. And, um, and again, um, 
that the administration was recommending that we approve of them. So any questions or comments from the commissioners? Uh, Madam President, I have one question. Maybe Jack or Diana can answer. On number seven, the capital improvement program, I remember initially you guys that came in with a request uh, for, for the monies to uh, the commission and we reduced your request, your CIP request. Um, does the 2.8 million take you to about where you were asking initially uh, before we decrease the amount for the CIP program? By looking Good afternoon, I will, I will <laughs> chime in on that. Um, so it, initially MSD requested 10 million for program contingency uh -huh. um, when we submitted our budget request last year. So um, that was reduced to 5 million so uh -huh. no, this um, does not take us up to the full 10, but the, the 2.8, um, you know, is, is in, a, in addition to the five that the board did approve. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Okay, Commissioner Parks? No questions, thank you. Okay, all right. Um, so Jackie, the um, seven and nine are allocations and it looks like number eight is a petition so are we just accepting that one yes ma'am all right so i'm going to move then that we approve of items seven and nine and accept item eight second commissioner dre house yes commissioner samar dumas yes commissioner parks yes all right thank you thank you to those from msd that were mm -hmm. on the team here all right, um, let's move on to the consent agenda items. Those would be items 10 through 23. Um, I know a couple of us had questions about items 18 and 21. Um, they stand out because of the high dollar amount associated with these items. They are similar to one another and they talk about transportation from the Medicaid population um, served by uh, JFS. So could we get some clarity either Jeff, or I don't know if Tim is on. Uh, can clarity on these two items? Yeah, certainly. So these are all, and I think uh, Laura or Tim may be on, but uh, these are these are Medicaid pass-throughs um, re relating to transportation, not uh, medical, uh, non-emergency medical transportation for individuals who are on Medicaid. Um, so these are all pass-through. This is not local dollars. Um, so. Uh, uh, from from that perspective, the board should should be aware of that as it relates to use of levy funds or something like that. Um, I would also indicate uh, that this is also a, a benefit of both of individuals who are uh, on on Medicaid. Uh, and speaking with um, Director McCartney, um, it's not one that is uh, widely known, and so individuals can access this if they're on Medicaid and and have need for. Um, uh, for non-emergency medical transportation. So it looks like Tim has popped up. Uh, Tim, you want to talk a little bit about that and how individuals who, who can, who need to access this benefit um, that the county does provide on uh, through Medicaid can access that? Sure, thanks, thanks Jeff, and thank you, Commissioner. Uh, yeah, uh, Jeff did a good job of describing uh, the program. Um, if you're eligible for Medicaid, you're eligible for this as a service, just like you'd be el eligible for a doctor's visit or, or anything else. Um, a lot of people don't take advantage of it because they, they have other means to get to a medical appointment or they feel more comfortable going to a medical appointment with a, with a daughter or a, you know, a, a husband or, or, or a neighbor or something like that. Uh, but as Jeff said, it's all federal pass through which means it's an eligibility program. If somebody's eligible, they get the service and the federal government pays for it. Um, and it, the, the dollars just pass through us to our contractor um, to do that. Um, people can call our agency at 946-1000 and press option six. Um, and that will connect them uh, to folks that will help them schedule their ride uh, there is advance, um, you, you call and make an advance uh, appointment, it's usually five days. Um, and if you have a reoccurring thing like dialysis or those sorts of things, they'll regularly schedule you um, and schedule you out through uh, a period of time. Uh, Hamilton County actually does more of this transportation than any other county in the state um, by leaps and bounds. Um, we do a variety of um, uh, training, or I'm sorry, uh, 
uh, trips um, related to all sorts of, of kids in our care um, and, and those sorts of things. So it's a wonderful service um, that uh, is available to, as I said, anybody that receives Medicaid. Is there a nexus here to access run by SORTA? Um, we currently, con as, as you see, we obviously um, contract this. There have been a variety of, of ways this has been done um, over the decades. Um, and, and we will provide, uh, you know, uh, metro passes for folks um, if, if riding with the vendor is not an option. We also will reimburse people's mileage um, if they do have a, a family member that uh, transports their um, uh, Medicaid eligible person um, to an appointment, we will pay for that uh, mileage. Um, in, in the old days, there were cabs. We don't do that um, yeah. anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, again, pretty much we'll do whatever we can to assist somebody who doesn't have the other means to get to a medical appointment. Okay, any questions or comments? Um, Madam President, just in general, um, as I looked at the items that came forth under JFS, um, and Tim, Tim and I are gonna talk later because I didn't give it to him till late last night, I think one in the morning. But I'm going to con continue to look at placement of children out of state and also the number of children that we're paying for and how long those providers have been uh, providing that service. I'm very much aware that children need some unique services that may not be offered in our county. And specifically, um, I move on to number 14, the bids and awards and contracts in our, from our purchasing department. Um, and that was a good um, spreadsheet on what uh, purchasing had been done for the month of May. Um, just asking if we can Add, and I, I, I'm not sure if I gave Jeff a note on this, but just another column, it has the name of the provider and how much we spent, but it really doesn't say what the services are that were provided. I mean, it's obvious with the roofing one, but some of them, Vertiv Core Corporation, uh, you know, I have, maybe it's technical, I don't know. But if we can add another column for Joanne on, on that data sheet and, and it, um, it looks a little antiquated. Uh, maybe we can kind of by January 2021, we can make it a fresh new uh, form that comes through for us. So that's all I had, Madam uh, President. Thank you. Commissioner no Park? Questions. No questions, thank you. Okay, thank you, Tim, for that explanation. Sure. Um, all right, I'm gonna move the, that we approve of consent agenda items 10 through 23. Second. Mr. Driehaus? Yes. Mr. Summer Dumas? Yes. Mr. Parks? Yes. Thank you. All right, Jeff, we're moving on to buy leaves, and we've got 15 of them. So, yeah. buy leaves. Uh, some um, of them can be grouped, though. So, <laughs> uh, and, and if I could just very, very quickly um, uh, at the, uh, uh, with, at the, with the discretion or the pleasure of the board, just comment briefly back on, um, on MSD. Uh, just so that the, the board is aware, just to, to wrap that up as it relates to the programmatic contingency. Um, and, and Commissioner Summer Dumas is, is correct that um, there was an initial request of 10 million. Uh, we, uh, it was, the board had lowered it to five. We're now back up about halfway to that. Uh, and again, I just wanna point out to the board that's, that's by design. I think when, mm -hmm. when the initial request came in, uh, we had indicated that the, the true amount of programmatic contingency needed uh, may be 5 million, it may be less than that, it may be 7, it may be 10, it may be 15. We don't know, um, but we would prefer to budget conservatively, and if there's a need, MSD comes back mm -hmm. in and defends it. So mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to make sure the board was yeah. aware that um, you know we'll, we'll be watching these as, as they come in. Certainly they'll come before the board. Um, but uh, the, the idea of MSD coming back for another programmatic contingency allotment is not out of the, the realm of, of what we discussed before. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, the board budgeted conservatively for that exact purpose. Great. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on to the, to the by leave items. Uh, by leave item one is a resolution approving and authorizing the filing of the third amendment to the fiscal year annual uh, action plan. Uh, this is that relates to the receipt of some additional federal dollars. 
uh, I believe in our emergency solutions grant that will be allocated towards strategies to end homelessness and some of their administration, as well as various homeless services. Uh, I believe Joy Pearson is available if there's any questions on this. I believe all the public notification requirements were met on this. Joy, anything you'd like to add? Yes, thank you. The, um, the, the plan does not specify uh, which, what amounts will be allocated to what services. Traditionally, there is a process in the with the continuum of care with strategies to end homelessness to manage the homeless clearinghouse and to allocate funding based on priorities of the providers. We as a county can provide policy direction, but right now HUD is allowing us to pass the plan with the, the um, stipulation that any and all of the services that could be provided are on the table. So we will come back to you uh, with additional information as far as the actual allocation. Um, you may remember with the first emergency solutions grant, we set aside $500,000 for hotels and motels and kept the other funding for housing services. This, um, in this situation, we don't, we don't anticipate a need for additional funding for hotels and motels, but it is in there in case that that is needed. Mm -hmm. Any questions or comments? Just happy about the uh, additional funding coming through. Thank you, Joy. Yeah, uh, this is good stuff. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to move that we approve of by leave number one. Second. Mr. Driehaus? Yes. Mr. Summer Dumas? Yes. Mr. Parks? Yes. Thank you, Commissioners. By leave two is an email communications requesting a moratorium on evictions during COVID-19. I believe this is just a receipt for the record. Yep. And let's go to three and four as well. Uh, three and four also email communications. Uh, the first from Ben Sherritt requesting commissioners use their influence to pressure and assist the city to move the CPD gun range out of Lincoln Heights. Uh, by lead four is email communications requesting the board consider including the impact racism has on mental health and any revisions in the resolution declaring racism as a public health crisis that gets back to our public here. All right, so these are on the agenda so that we can accept them as uh, for the record. So I'm gonna move that we accept items by leave two, three and four for the record. Um, so moved, I just wanted to make a comment though. Can I do that or you wanna? Well, let's, let's get through the motion. Okay, so moved. Second. Second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Now you want to talk about it, discuss? Yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to indicate that the Lincoln Heights gun range really, uh, I know Senator uh, Sherrod Brown said that was number one on his list when he was here visiting for something else. And it's been going on for 40, I can't say exactly how many years, 40, 50 years. Um, uh, when I was a village manager, I know and I used to work at night, were at night, and they're devastating to, to the families and the children. And I'm just imploring that um, our commission uh, look at taking the forefront as it relates to this gun range. I know it's not in Lincoln Heights, it's in Evendale, and try to get a partnership or collaboration to finally end uh, this gun range, which um, Cincinnati um, Police Department are saying it's too expensive to move and all, uh, but the damage has been going on for too long. And I'm really, really um, excited about our opportunity to maybe this year uh, at least come to some sort of plan on getting that gun range out of that area. It's in the isolated uh, back part of the woods of Evendale, but it's right on the residential street of Lincoln Heights. When you go right on that residential street, all these signs says, watch out for the gun range. So it's just been going on too long. And I think it would be great for our board to really go uh, have, be in the forefront of making that um, um, leave Lincoln Heights. That's all I had. Thank you. Um, so Victoria, I know you've been involved in this a little bit as have I. So. Um, given that it's the CPD gun range, I reached out to Chris Smitherman over um, at the city, the head of the Long um, Public Safety Committee, to see what they were doing and offered um, our assistance. Uh, remember that the sheriff has a gun range as well uh, up in Coleraine Township. And, you know, we were kicking around ideas about whether or not the county could um, offer um, part of that facility or, you know, possibly expand that 
facility to accommodate CPD. Uh, we did reach out to some of the electeds in Coleraine mm -hmm. to make sure that yeah. they wouldn't object to that. Uh, they are more than happy with having that gun rage in the community. They like the police presence up there. Um, so I, I did make that initial outreach, uh, made sure that uh, Council Member Smitherman was aware of our willingness to work on this with the city, uh, and, but I have not yet heard back. So I don't know, Commissioner right. Parks, if you have additional information? Um, I do not, but um, I do know that we spoke about it. Um, mm -hmm. Also reached out and talked to the mayor in Lincoln Heights, and I have actually witnessed it. Um, I, I think it's awful. Yeah. These children, yeah. they grow up, you know, with the sound of, of gunfire mm -hmm. in, in their lives. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And it's, and it's open 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. I think I, I, I am hopeful that Cincinnati Police Department will take this seriously and um, and, and take our offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, and I agree. It creates all kinds of trauma, long-term trauma yes. for the folks that I, it scared me. It, it, yeah, I can me. imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I maybe I'll, I'll circle back with Christopher and or Council Member Smitherman uh, and see what the status is. But uh, mm -hmm. right when the, we were all getting a whole bunch of letters, and mm -hmm. so right when that happened, I reached out. So I'll, I'll circle back and see if I can. Right. And the the coal ring gun range is is not in a residential area, from what I remember. But I'll check to make sure. I think that's why they don't really have a problem with it. So okay, yeah. great. All right. Thank you. All right, so we've got a motion and a second to accept these for the record. Commissioner Dre House? Yes. Commissioner Samajemas? Yes. Commissioner Parks? Yes. Thank you. All right, item bylaws of 5 through 13 are all related to CDBG. Uh, we've talked about this now a couple of times, and as we all know, the one change here is an extra 25000 to mortar. That's by leave 5. Um, we all agreed that that was a good investment. And so, Joy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's the only thing that has changed from the original? That's correct. The recommendations of the Community Development Advisory Committee were followed with the additional funding that was added. Right, so, and thank you to that group for, and Joy, yes. please pass along our gratitude. I will, thank you. Their work and yours. Mm -hmm. um, all right, commissioners, any questions or comments related to these bylaws? No questions or comments. Um, I'm just happy about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to move that we approve of by leaves item 5 through 13. Second. Mr. Driehaus? Yes. Mr. Samarjumas? Yes. Mr. Parks? Yes. Thank you. All right, we're on to 14, Jeff. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, so 14 is a resolution authorizing uh, the administrator to enter into a first amendment to the city county uh, cooperation agreement. Uh, this relates to um, the banks project. We discussed this a little bit. Uh, in staff meeting on Tuesday. Uh, the bank's cooperation agreement is the framework that guides uh, the, the interaction between the public parties on the bank's project. Uh, we still need to finalize some of the details with the city, uh, but uh, this is a version that we think um, adheres to the high level principles uh, that we know uh, Commissioner Portune and Mayor Cranley had discussed previously, uh, while at the same time making sure that the county is not exposed to any uh, undue uh, financial risk, or that the project is uh, placed in a position of being financially uh, unsustainable. So uh, with the board's approval, this item will continue conversations uh, with uh, with the city of Cincinnati to get to a, uh, a version of the agreement that, um, that accomplishes all of those goals. So the administration recommends approval of this item. Thank you. Questions or comments? Just comment that, of course, this agreement provides clarity for the city from the county. And we definitely need that because there seems to be some confusion. That's all I have. Okay. No, I have no comments. Okay, but great. They... I'm going to move them. We approve of by leave item 14. Second. Mr. Dre House? Yes. Mr. Samajumas? Yes. Mr. Parks? Yes. All right, Jeff. Finally, you, item 15. By, I, by leave item 15, uh, this is an agreement. Uh, related to uh, the execution of a uh, steel preservation uh, project down at Great American Ballpark. This is one that we kept off of the agenda or moved off of the agenda several months ago as COVID-19 was just starting to get uh, to, to come into, uh, um, into full swing. And we had pushed this off pending uh, more study on what we were anticipating in terms of 
uh, our revenues uh, in the fund, in the, se in the separate fund that funds these capital projects. So we have seen uh, the, our, our revenue forecast increase uh, a bit as it relates to, to that fund. So we think it's important that we move forward with the capital projects down there. There's also gonna be some operational savings uh, as we do not have as many games, obviously. We're, we're uh, thrilled to have a 60 game schedule coming up uh, with the Reds, but uh, that's um, uh, significantly shorter than what we normally see. So we're gonna see some operational savings uh, there. So we think it's important that we move forward on the capital preservation while at the same time uh, saving on some of the oper operating costs as well. So uh, the administration does recommend approval so that we can take advantage of the current bid and move forward with the project and avoid having to rebid it um, for uh, next capital project season. Because ultimately the work um, will have to be done in order to preserve the structure of the, of the facility. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to point out that this is maintenance work that we were um, you know, we were trying to be cautious about the revenue scene, but the operating costs have been reduced pretty significantly. Um, so that's very helpful as we look at this in the context of the fund. So um, any questions or comments? No, no questions or comments. No questions or comments. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to move that we approve of by leave item number 15. Second. Commissioner Driehaus? Yes. Commissioner Summer Dumas? Yes. Commissioner Parks? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. That would be the end of, of my by leaves. I do have just one additional comment. I know we have some executive sessions to go into. Yeah. Um, I, I did want to uh, recommend to the board that we add one executive session uh, relates to an HR labor issue. It will, I promise it will be very short. Uh, it's just something we need some uh, 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 guidance on as it relates to uh, human resources. Uh, but I would, uh, it would be myself, Mike Friedman, and Frank Spataro in that executive session. All right. So I am then going to move, and, and I don't have that exact language in front of me, Jeff, for the um, third executive session. I, so, think, I think you could, uh, to, uh, I'll defer to, to Mike Friedman, uh, but I think a discussion of collective bargaining um would be a a a, a, uh, a specific enough reference um michael if you're on could you opine on that and if, unless you have the exact yes uh commissioner Driehaus, if you want to um I have a pen here to jot it down but it would be to enter an executive session pursuant to ohio revised code section 120 i'll slow down i'll do that again I you what, michael how about putting it in the chat box uh, i can do that I, right now I can read it how about that Okay. All right. That's what we're going to do. So I'm going to talk about the other two first. And by then, hopefully you'll have it in the chat and I'll just read it. Okay. All right. So I am, unless there's anything else from anybody, we're going to move into executive sessions. So executive session pursuant to RC section 121.22 G3 to conduct a conference with an attorney to discuss petting litigation. I will move that we go into that one. And also another executive session pursuant to RC section 121. Point twenty two G three to conduct a conference with an attorney concerning MSD and give me one second. Oh Michael. And a third executive session pursuant to RC section. Is one, it G one or four, Michael? Excuse me? Is it one or four? My understanding is it's G four. All right. All right, so Pursuant to RC section 121.22 G4, to conduct a conference to conduct a conference regarding collective bargaining. Michael, get it? Sure. Are we good? Hold on, hold on. I just I, finished, but yeah, so you, that's correct. You can read when I read right there. Can I though? So. Yeah. Can I though? <laughs> yeah, I don't. Well, so I don't see it. So was that enough, Michael? Um, yes, I, if you want to just say to conduct a conference uh, to review negotiations with the collective bargaining unit. All right, I'm going to rephrase my third one. Uh, I move that we go into the third executive session pursuant to RC section 121.22 G3, G4, I'm sorry, to conduct a conference regarding collective bargaining negotiations that will do <laughs> so move 
Second. Commissioner Duhouse? Yes. Commissioner Summer Dumas? Yes. Commissioner Parks? Yes. Commissioners, I think the setup will take longer than the session. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. Are we staying on here for this exact session? I think you're doing a conference call. We are not. Uh, the conference call number, I'll circulate it one more okay. time for all of you. Very good. Thank you. Oh, okay. close the conference call. Okay. Hey, can we have like five minutes? Yes, five minutes. Okay. Yep. 